Welcome to Christ Fellowship Church this morning. Um, to those who are here and those who are at home watching, it's our prayer that you join us in worship today. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit here with us today. Father, we pray that your presence will come and fill this place. Holy Spirit, may you fall afresh on us this morning. Whatever it is that is holding us back from being in your presence, God, whatever it is, may you wash that away right now in Jesus' name. That it will be about you this morning, God. That it will be about you and the cross. That we will realize that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That there is power in your name and that nothing else matters, God. Holy Spirit, may you take control and be with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Shall we please stand as we worship? Amen. Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated. 
fighting for us. Amen. We find refuge and shelter in the name of Jesus. When we fall, he's our savior. And when we call, he's the answer, amen. The Bible tells us in John 20, 31 that, that these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Acts 4, 12 tells us that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven 
given to mankind by which we must be saved. Philippians 2, 9-12 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Shall we glorify and bless the name because of Jesus? Because there's no other name than that name. The name of Jesus. And not just about the name. It's the person behind that name. There's so much power. We find shelter. We find refuge in this name. There's power in this name. Thank you, God. The name of Jesus is greater. The name of Jesus is stronger. The name of Jesus is higher.
Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you came down and you became the grave. Oh, that you were above all things. You humbled yourself. And because of that, we are victorious in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shall be broken. You are the victor. 
sisters. I can't hear you. Let's take that again. Just the voices. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. You overcome. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. The last time. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. You overcome. Amen. That was really good. I don't know if you heard it or not. <laughs> Evidently, I've turned it on and turned it off now three times. Should I start from the top? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. No. Doesn't it feel good to be a winner? Amen. You're a victor. Amen. In Jesus, all things are under his feet. Yes. What are we struggling with in life this morning? What is there that can come against us? What can stand against us? In Christ, every stronghold, everything, all things have been put under his feet. Amen. He is the victor. And we are in him, the fullness of him. And so in him, we are victors too. Amen. Isn't it good to be a winner? Yes. Lord, we thank you. everything that you do. Lord, for the power that you have displayed, the power on our behalf, Lord, the power that you have given us, the 
same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, is available to us. Through that power, every stronghold has been conquered, has been defeated, has been placed under the feet of Jesus. We thank you. Whatever that may be in our lives right now, whatever difficulty, struggle, challenge, whatever situation it is that we're facing, Lord, we give it to you. We lay it down because we know you've won. The victory has already been declared. This situation has already been defeated. We give it to you, Lord. for us and that you are with us and nothing can stand against us but those of us who are in you so we give it up this morning we lay it down at your feet and we ask Lord that this morning that your presence would continue to abide with us that it would continue to be tangible and palpable that it would be known and felt the same thing this morning we pray every week that we would leave here different than we showed up having been in your presence with your people we give it all to you we love you we thank you we pray these things in the name of your son Jesus amen amen, amen. amen. worship team thank you guys so much I want you to give them a hand and at this time, I'm going to ask the Bentles to stay. And youth leaders, Gozi, could you come on up? We, one thing we didn't get to do last year because of, well, you know, was recognize our graduates, our high school graduates last year. And so we definitely want to do that this year. This year, we have a few high school graduates and one college graduate. And I think we have a slide up here as well. So Kelly TG, come on up, come on. And we have uh, Kyra Serpas, who was able to be with us this morning. That is for you. And we have a college graduate. It's about time, John, that you... Dr. John Bentzel. Our, our 20, 20, that is a small comparison to what you have paid for that DR, but it's given with grace and love. Our 2021 graduate, and we have, you know, last year, whatever, we have some 2020 graduates who missed out on a graduation and all that good stuff. So, would you come up, Stephanie Chichi Wu and Zab? Would you come up, 2020 Zab Hood? Come on up, our 2020 graduates. And Sophie, Sophie Dorr also was a 2020 graduate. She was not able to be with us this morning, but we want to, they've already received their gift last year, correct? Yes? Okay. So, but we want to take a moment and recognize them. Uh, it, it, and honor them and thank them and just say congratulations. You are victors of school. You have, Jesus wears the victor crown, you have worn the victor mortarboard. And you have put school under your feet for now. So we just want to have a quick prayer over these guys and just uh, ask God to bless them uh, for their future endeavors. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for these individuals. God, we ask that your hand would be upon them. Lord, you know the plans that you have for them. You know the path that you have carved for them. Lord, we just ask that there would be signposts, bright and blaring, pointing in the direction for them that they are to go. Lord, that your way would be like a neon sign unmistakable, that your hand would be felt at all times, that there would never be time when they did not know 
that they were in your presence, Lord. We just pray for smooth roads and easy sailing. Lord, be with them, guide them, lead them. Thank you for them. Thank you for what you have done in their lives. Thank you for what you are doing in their lives. And thank you in advance, Lord, for all the things that you are going to do in them and through them in the future, impacting this world for your kingdom. We put them in your hands, Lord, and we trust in your goodness. We love you and we thank you. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Congratulations, guys. And at this time, our children can be dismissed. And we just have, uh, real quick, two announcements. Um, one, same as always, meal train for Roxy. I would love for you to sign up. You can take a meal. You can do a gift card, any of those things like that. Links are in your emails. And then as well as there was a link uh, in your emails for the Sisters in Christ for the women's trip to see Esther Sight and Sound. It's going to be September the 11th. That has been changed in all communication. So September the 11th, you can sign up in the back. You can sign up online, and there will be more information to come about all of that. And, of course, if you have any questions, you can see Emily, Cristiano, or Equa, and they will get back to you with any questions that you might have. Uh, it's an $84 ticket. We're, we're, we're only charging you guys 40 because we like you. So we're going to pay, the Sisters of Christ is going to pay for part of that, part of your ticket. So it's a great deal. You're not going to get to go cheaper that I know of. So uh, sign up in the back. You can sign up online. Love to have you be a part of that. All right. We have a special guest for you this morning. It's weird to say guest. We have a special member of our church this morning to share with you this morning. Uh, you get a break from me. You don't have to listen to me talk anymore as soon as I sit down. So would you give a warm welcome to Dr. Reverend Megan Musi? my home church and you are family. And so I'm so grateful to be here and have the opportunity to speak today. Um, but be here the big show is just to be here with you, and I see even more faces that are back that I haven't seen yet, so I'm glad that you're here. Uh, Pastor Will has been leading a sermon series on emotions, on feelings, and it's usually not something we talk a lot about in church. Um, it's usually something we talk about only in terms of managing them, because our emotions can be really messy, and emotions can be... Um, something that make us, they, we're, we're vulnerable when we show our emotions. And sometimes th when we're in church groups, we feel like, which feeling, emotion, um, that we don't have the freedom to express all emotions. That maybe there are certain emotions that are not allowed in the sanctuary. Or we like whisper about them, right? Or there's something to control or to like get under control before we can truly um, be open with our brothers and sisters in Christ around us or be open with the Lord. But emotions are God given, they're part of our human experience. We are emotional beings. And so, yes, they can be mushy, they can be messy, they can be hard to handle. Sometimes they can be overwhelming, but they're just something to steward. And so there's something to keep track of and, and to keep tabs on um, because they can be indicators of what's really going on around us. So uh, most of you know me, but um, you've known me through the years. So my PhD was in Old Testament, and my specialization is Psalms. So that's what I wrote my dissertation on. Have you ever read the book of Psalms? Like, that is an emotional book, right? But you know, some people actually say Psalms are for, like, singing or praying, but not for teaching. There's even a book of common prayer that says, like, these are not to be 
preached or taught. But I remember, I know it's New Testament, but I'm pretty sure there's a place in the New Testament where it says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. And so what do we find in the book of Psalms? Well, we find kind of this guidebook, not just for prayer. Some people call it just a book of prayer. It's not just a book of prayer, but it's a book of lament, of crying out to God. It's a book of testimony. There are places where we declare to brothers and sisters in Christ like the goodness of God. There's, there are places of prophecy where we hear from the Lord in the Psalms. And so the book of Psalms is, again, an emotional book because it just lays bare all of the experience of humanity. You think about Psalm 88, which is, I think, like the saddest <laughs> psalm, and it ends with, darkness is my closest friend. Not like, hallelujah, but Jesus is good. It just ends, darkness is my closest friend. The end. Or Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like, I don't know really a worse feeling than that if you feel like God has forsaken you. But that encapsulates like the experience of Naomi, right, who she goes out of her home country with her husband and her children, and she comes back. She says, I've come back empty. I left full, and I've come back empty, and the hand of God has gone out against me. Well, Psalm 22 is Naomi's psalm, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or then we have these psalms that seem a lot more sketchy to us, like Psalm 137, where it ends, like it ends with, blessed is the one who bashes your baby's heads against the rocks. And you're like, okay, that made it in the Bible, and we just like let it live there. And so sometimes it can be, you, we like read it, but we don't always read it in church, or like we read it in groups, and we're like, I don't know what to do with this. But these are the real emotions of the people of God. These are our brothers and sisters. I mean, it is before Jesus came, but we know they're still in Christ. But these are people who had such a audacious faith that they could express all of these emotions to the face of God. And they were not smited for it. And so there are things that we can do to process our emotions and to act on them in a righteous way. The book of Psalms sets that standard for us. And the book of Psalms are something that, even if we're not always preaching and teaching it, I think a lot of us cling to. When we send soldiers off to war, we even give them little New Testaments with the Psalms, which as an Old Testament scholar, like, I take issue with, you know, leaving out all the other books of the Old Testament. But we send soldiers off with the New Testament and the book of Psalms because we think they'll find comfort there. There's comfort found in the Psalms of hearing these voices of these ancient um, faith community saying these things. And there's a scholar, Walter Brueggemann, who um, was kind of pushing back, actually, against other scholars who were kind of, like, making all these categories to sort the, psalm, sort the psalms into. And he says, you know what? The reason that these ancient poems and songs and prayers are still relevant for us today, like, besides the word of God, is because humanity hasn't changed. The human experience is the same, like, and God is the same. And so he says, instead of like having all these little, like, there's just a lot of categories, it's a whole thing. He's like, instead of having all of those, you could sort all the Psalms into three categories based on like what's happening in your life. And so his three categories, and he says, all humanity, at some point, each one of you, you're in one of these three stages. And each psalm is in, each one, of, is in one of these three stages. There's orientation. You're oriented to life, like life is good, you know what you're doing. It's sunny with a high of 75, like you're carefree. Which is not usually where we all are, right? But we have those days. He says, but then there's disorientation. Those days when you're like, what is happening? Like 2020, right? Like that was a year, we're still kind of coming out, right? So disorientation, that things aren't fine. You're not adjusted to the way things are, right? Maybe you've like failed an exam or something's happened at your job or maybe you're fighting with someone in your family that that's disorientation, that things aren't great, you need something to be fixed. 
And the third category is reorientation, which is like kind of what we all are in now. Like besides Springfield, Missouri, if you've seen that in the news, that's where I usually live. So I'm thankful to be here. But we're in reorientation. We're coming out of a pandemic. And we're like, okay, we're not fully in disorientation where we were. We're like readjusting to life. And so he would say reorientation, those are like our testimony psalms. We're like, you're on the other side, but you're like, I remember what the bottom of the pit was like. When you're in reorientation, you're not thinking about the pit. You're just thinking about good things. So a lot of times we think of the psalms as the reorientation ones, or we'll turn to comforting ones, which tend to be reorientation, like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it's this testimony of how God has provided and God protects. And even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. But it's kind of like, if you have to say that to yourself, it's because you know there is a valley of the shadow of the death, and you don't want to be there, right? And so it's one of these testimony psalms. But it's that category of disorientation, which we probably resonate with the most. There's actually more disorientation psalms in the book of Psalms than any other kind but they're harder to talk about. And we don't always know what to do with them. Like I said, Psalm 137 about, you know, baby's heads on rocks. But those psalms of disorientation, they wrestle with the goodness of God in light of injustice in this world. And sometimes it seems like they have these kind of like mood swings. Like... They'll explain how bad things are. Actually, Psalm 22 is one of those. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And like at the end, they're singing like praise choruses. And you're like, are we just having these weird mood swings? Like what's happening? And I want to look at one of those mood swing psalms today. Because we're talking about emotions and feelings. And sometimes it feels like we're on this weird pendulum just going back and forth. Sometimes it feels out of control. But sometimes they're not really mood swings. It's an adjustment to our perspective. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 73, um, this is one of the Psalms that struggles with, that wrestles with the injustice around the psalmist in light of the goodness of God. And the fancy word for this is theodicy. So it's trying to figure out if God is good and sovereign He's in control. Why are bad things happening to good people? And why are good things happening to bad people? And see, that is called the retribution principle. And it comes up over and over again in scripture. And it's actually still around in our culture today. Like sometimes we'll call it karma or we'll say things like, well, what goes around comes around. And sometimes that's true. Like if you make certain bad choices, like there are consequences, right? Like, if you eat an entire cake in one sitting and then you have a stomach ache, like, there's a correlation there, right? So sometimes there are consequences, like, you did that. <laughs> but sometimes there are things like, I don't know why some people get cancer and others don't. I don't know why some people die young and then you, have, like, and good people, and then you have, like, heathens that have, like, really long lives. And <laughs> you're like, what? Right? And so it doesn't seem to make sense to us. And so the retribution principle is, and this is not from God, this is from our cultures, says, well, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And that's true on a group level, like the church, the bride of Christ, like we win. But in our daily lives, it's really harmful to think, well, I got a flat tire because I sinned this morning or to draw those correlations. And so constantly, God is sending people, like we see in scripture, like that are, trying to, that are challenging that thinking because it's not true. Look at the book of Job. Job is sick, he loses his children, like his business goes to pot, and he's righteous. And his friends are surrounding him saying like, I don't know, Job, we know good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, and bad things are happening to you, thus you must be bad. And he's like, Straight up, I'm not. like. And God's like, that's correct. I'm just not telling you. Job never finds out. But God, God's like, yep, you're good. And then it gets restored. But bad things happen to good people. But that doesn't nullify the goodness of God. But it's hard to live with that reality. And that's what we find here in this psalm. 
The psalm starts, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And you want to say, Amen, right? God is good. Oh, guys, you did this to Pastor Will when he didn't even want you to a few weeks ago. God is good all the time. But does he feel good like when you get a bad diagnosis or when you're grieving a loved one or when you fail a test and you studied for it? When bad things are happening and you see the wicked flourishing, it doesn't feel like that. And this psalm is a wisdom psalm. It's teaching us something about life. And so the psalmist starts, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped, and I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from, uncom- from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Can, like, we're not going to name them out loud, but can you think of people in your life that <laughs> maybe don't make the best choices but seem to be doing great? Or people at work that cut corners, or maybe they're not always nice to clients, or they're just not people of integrity and they're like getting bonuses or promotions. We see people in our culture that are praised, and like on social media, like no matter what they do, like they're having affairs, they're living lives of debauchery, they tell lies, they put out immoral material, and they get really big checks and fame and fortune. Or like we could turn to politics, right? That we look at what is praised in our world, what is engaged the most. Like think about Facebook posts and Instagram and Twitter, like the things that pick up the most steam are the most like ridiculous things, right? And usually ungodly things. And so this psalmist starts out that you're like, God is good all the time, and they're like, amen. He's like, but um, I'm like going down, and these people are doing great, and they're making all the wrong choices, and there's no consequences. In fact, it seems like they're being rewarded for their sin. And it's so out of control, their pride is like a necklace. Like they're not even embarrassed by their sin. That it's like an ornament they wear. And it comes to the point where, and so usually psalmists, and like, it's the worst allegation is like the speech part. So that's why it's kind of down there towards the end of this list of grievances, right? So it's like they have no struggles and they're carefree and all that. And it's like, And people come and talk to them, and they say, like, God doesn't know anything. What does God know? And so there in verse 12, you kind of have this summary. This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Would you describe the psalmist's emotions at this point as, like, positive or negative? (laughs) Negative. (laughs) Like, we could come up with maybe a list, like, frustration, disappointment, disgust, right? And I kind of picture the psalmist here just throwing up their hands. This is what they're like. And they just, they don't even care. They're free of cares. And I'm like over here worrying about them and they're not worrying about anything. And that's, we have, we all have those moments. See the psalmist, their emotions are the same emotions we experience. And so then the psalmist kind of turns inward. So they've explained the external problem. The wicked are doing great, and I'm not. And then here's kind of the theological wrestling that the psalmist has to do. It says, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure, and I've washed my hands in innocence. 
All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. He's like, okay, so being like righteous, being a person of God, has not made my life better, is what it feels like. And like, if I've been in a person of integrity and I'm not doing well, then all of this has been meaningless. But then he's like, but I don't think I can say that, (laughs) even though it's here in the psalm, right? So in verse 15, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. And sometimes we feel like that, that we're struggling with reconciling our experience in this life with the goodness of God, but we don't think we can talk about it to our church people because then maybe they'll question our faith or maybe they'll question like Job's friends like well if bad things are happening to you like maybe you're doing bad things it's retribution principle it's not the gospel right (laughs) that and so we're sometimes afraid to express those things out loud even though that is an exact picture of what is happening in our inner life and our emotions are just our inner life And we don't always like to show that, especially when we're grappling with things like this. Um, Pastor Alan Beauchamp, he did a sermon series on emotions, and he defined, this is like his own definition that I'm going to tinker with, but he talks about emotions as being kind of the intersection of our beliefs and our values. And beliefs, it might be easier to think of as more like experience. So on a really like simplistic, trivial level, um... When you're driving down New Hampshire and someone cuts you off, which is an experience, right? If you believe they're disrespecting you, because sometimes like someone cuts you off because they're like swerving to not hit someone else and you're like, oh, we're just trying to make sure everyone stays alive, right? But if they cut you off and you feel like that was aggressive and they're disrespecting you and you value respect, then you have negative emotions, right? But there are other things that when what you experience conflicts with your values or threatens your values, then emotions bubble up. And sometimes they're positive and sometimes they're negative. Have you ever um, had a conversation with someone that they were telling you something that they thought you would be upset by, but you weren't? And then it's like super awkward (laughs) because they're trying to comfort you, but you don't need to be comforted. Um, This happened to me at my last school, that I was over a scholarship fund, and the dean had given me, like, policies. Like, I just had to follow the rules. And one of the rules meant this other professor, he was over a program, like, that his students wouldn't qualify for something he wanted. But it wasn't my rule, it was the dean's. And so my colleague, like, found out that his students would lose a benefit, And so he, like, went to the dean, and they both came up to me and, like, pulled me aside and were, like, telling me in this, like, side room conversation, like, so you need to do this, and, like, talking to me like I was going to be upset. And and they're, like, so you need to give this back and blah, blah, blah. And I just said, okay. (laughs) And they were, like, well, you know. And I was, like, I mean, this was your rule. If you want that to be the rule, like, that's fine with me. Like, it's not my own personal money. And so, but they were so concerned that I was going to like fight back or be upset about it that they had come in thinking that but they didn't understand what my values were because I didn't care that much about being right about that rule like I didn't care about that I just wanted to do what I was supposed to do right and the dean tells me what to do what to do so I cared more about just obedience that was my value then like I didn't have my respect wasn't on the table for that or whatever. So it was funny. I was like, I'm okay. I'm like, oh. I was like, I'll do that. Cool. But our emotions are often there at that intersection. So when we experience something positive and we value whatever that was, like when someone that we value, that we care about, does something good for us, like we have a lot of positive emotions, right? And it's different than if someone that we're, like, acquaintances with. When someone that's just an acquaintance says something to you, whether it's positive or negative, you only have so much of a reaction because they're an acquaintance. 
when someone that's close to you says something to you, whether it's positive or negative, you probably have a bigger reaction. And so when, when Pastor Allen was talking about this emotions are your beliefs or experience mixed with um, your values, he said, so that's one reason we shouldn't stifle our emotions. Because our emotions can be indicators of what we value. So when you're feeling things, you have all the feels, <laughs> ask yourself, why did I have this reaction? And sometimes, and like most of the time, hopefully it's most of the time, it's for righteous reasons. Because someone was disrespecting you. No one should be disrespected, right? Or because you valued that person's opinion, they, that was an important person to you, and that did hurt your feelings. And those are valid experiences and emotions. And but there are times to think, oh, well, I felt like this because I was prideful about that. And so that can be a good check and balance. But think about our emotions as indicators of our values and then our beliefs can help us kind of sort out what's going on and why we're reacting certain ways. And oftentimes, our reactions can be righteous, but it also can serve as a corrective. So the psalmist here lays out, he's like, he says this kind of faith statement, like God is good to his people, amen, but um, that is not what I'm currently experiencing. And I feel like if I talk about it, uh, like he's like, I can't talk about it because then I betray all your people. And then I love it. We have this like shift here. So I'll start in verse 16 and the shift comes in 17. And not only is it a shift in perspective, but it's a shift to prayer. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They're like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. So you're like, oh, great. We go to church, like in the sanctuary, things are set right. And then we're saying God does really terrible things to people. And they're like, are we allowed to say that and be glad about it? Um, my great-grandmother, who... If you've been here a really long time, you might have met her. But um, the last few years of her life, she lived with my grandparents. And she was in her 90s, and I was in middle school. And if my grandparents needed to go out and run errands, and it was kind of too long to leave her alone, I would, like, babysit grandma. Um, and she would, she would listen to the Bible on cassette. Some of you are too young to know what that is. Tapes. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. Um, but she would listen to, like, audiobooks for the Bible, and, or she, she had a bell. She'd ring her bell, and I, she asked me to read scripture her to her once, and I don't remember what psalm it was now, and I wish I could, but she said which psalm she wanted, and it was King James, and so I'm reading out loud, and, which, that's just as important, because I usually read NIV, and I was kind of stumbling over it, but I'm reading, and it's saying things like, and your enemies will be eaten by dogs, and things like this. And I said, Grandma, I think this is the wrong psalm. And she, she was like, no, it's not. Keep reading. And I always thought that was so funny, um, which it kind of just also is part of her personality. But I was like, oh, I thought you would want something comforting. Why am I reading about people's destruction? I've just always grappled with that, so it's now funny that I'm a psalm scholar. But this is kind of what I've, I think I figured out. She was in her 90s. She had a good life, but it wasn't an easy life. She was born in 1905. Her, her mother had passed away in childbirth, and after that, her father had become an alcoholic. She helped um, raise the, her younger siblings that were left behind. She raised six children in the Great Depression. She had miscarriages. She saw injustice in the community. There were things she had to deal with. And I think at the end of her life, she wanted to know that God saw everything and would make everything right. If someone has wronged you, don't you want it made right? Like if someone attacks you, 
Now, if, like, they get saved and make restitution, then you're like, okay, praise the Lord. But, like, you want them brought to justice. Like, you want there to be a court case, right? You want someone to acknowledge that what was done to you happened, and it was bad and not right, and that that person shouldn't have done that. And that's what these psalms are. When the psalmist is like, but God, you're going to get them, so I'm okay, he's putting faith in the justice of God. And he's trusting the Lord to make all the wrong things right. Because it's not up to us. Now, there are times that like we can fix situations and we can speak into it, and I'm not saying we should be passive. But we should know who we should trust. We don't trust our experience all the time. Because sometimes we misperceive things. Like maybe that person that cut you off really didn't see you. Now, still not like safe driving. But maybe they weren't disrespecting you. They just didn't see you. Or sometimes our emotions can be triggered by other things. They can be influenced by like hormones, chemicals in our bodies, right? They can We can have like accumulation of things that come up and all of our emotions come out in one instance. So we can't always trust our emotions. They're not something to stifle. They're something to grapple with, to identify, and then say, why do I feel like this? We're not supposed to put our trust in feelings. We're supposed to put our trust in God. And so the psalmist here is like, I was have, like struggling with all of this. I didn't know what to do. And I came to the sanctuary of God. And what I realized was, this isn't the end of the story. And so the psalmist goes on to say in verse 21, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. And you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? The earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you, but as for me. So remember we started with a, well, we had like, God is good, but... And here we have another, but, but as for me, it is good to be your near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Sometimes life is really hard and like we will have a lot of feelings about it. And that doesn't mean that everything's explained or everything's resolved. But the psalmist is saying Even with all the wicked flourishing today, I know it's better to be near God than to be like that. Because this isn't the end of the story. The retribution principle isn't true on an individual level on a daily basis, right? So the retribution principle is good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, which we all can think of examples where that's not true. But we do know that those who are close to the Lord are saved and will have eternal life. Eventually, it's true. When we think about the church of Christ, right? Those that belong to the Lord are saved. They're healed. They're redeemed. They're restored. And those who do not put their trust in the Lord perish. But it's not in the daily, what our medical needs are. We're talking about eternity. And so the psalmist brings all of his feelings before the Lord. And that's one thing I want us to take away from this psalm. The psalmist doesn't say, I had all these feelings and I had to take care of them before I came to you. He brings all of his emotions before the Lord and like takes an inventory and says, Here's the thing I'm supposed to say. Here's everything uh, that's happening. Here's how I feel about it. And then he stops, says, and I came into the sanctuary. There in verse 16 and 17. And then I understood their final destiny. 
you can trust God with all of your feelings. And when you bring them to him, some are validated. He'll comfort us. Sometimes he has to calm us down, right? But being a, a follower of Christ doesn't mean we don't have feelings. It doesn't mean that we're emotionless uh, sheep. We've seen over this past series, like, Jesus had big emotions. God has emotions. You should be angry about injustice. You should grieve for the lost. You can have joy in the Lord. And these things are not mutually exclusive. You know, scholars often talk about, it's, I mean, this is just theological language, but orthodoxy. So that would be right belief. And there's orthopraxy, which is right practice. We don't often talk about orthopathy, which is right feeling. Because, again, we, like, stifle those things. But we're called to have the right feelings about things, like injustice in the world. It would be a problem if the psalmist wasn't upset about the injustice. It would be really weird if Job wasn't upset that his children died and he was sick and lost his business. We would actually, like, probably take him to a mental health institute, right? Because we're like, you should feel things about this. So our feelings are not something to be embarrassed by. They are just an indication that we're human beings, that we're emotional beings. They are something to trust God with. Um, Dan Allender and Tremper Longman wrote a book called Cry of the Soul. And they said, ignoring our emotions is turning our back on reality. Listening to our emotions ushers us in reality, and reality is where we meet God. That's what we find here in verse 17, that the psalmist brings his reality, which the Lord already knew, before the Lord, and he has a perspective shift. And then he's able to say, well, I, I know where they're going, and I know where I'm going. And he says, and I actually know that I'm always with you and you have me by the right hand. And that's why he can end the psalm, but as for me, it's good to be near God. It's not in vain that I wash my hands in innocence. It's not in vain that I live a righteous life, like I might not get the bonus, and I'm not getting that raise, or people around me might not acknowledge it. But there's one who always sees, and that's who I need to care about the most. Uh, Longman and Allender go on to say, emotions are the language of the soul. They are the cry that gives the soul a voice. However, we often turn a deaf ear through emotional denial, distortion, and disengagement. We strain out anything disturbing in order to gain a false sense of control over our inner world. In uh, Proverbs 3, it talks about, I really like the comparison with this psalm because here, remember, the wicked wear pride like a necklace. And in, in Proverbs 3, it talks about how we should be wearing steadfast love like a necklace. And we should wear God's truth and faithfulness like jewelry. And then in verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, only not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Take all of the things that you're feeling and all of the things you're wrestling with and bring it to the presence of the Lord. Because remember, Trember and Allender say, listening to our emotions usher ushers in reality, and reality is where we meet God. And so the Lord is calling you today to bring your whole self before him. And even those that have already accepted Christ as Savior, sometimes we hold parts of ourselves back from the Lord, as if they're actually secret but we're not always honest in our relationship with him about what we're really struggling with or we're embarrassed about parts of, you know, things that we're thinking or that we're feeling. But God wants to be in relationship with all of you. And he doesn't think you should be covered in shame. He wants to know you and love all of you and walk with, in life with you and take you by the right hand. Will you pray with me today? If there's anyone here that has not made a commitment to follow Christ, or 
you have maybe walked away from the Lord and your relationship with the Lord has grown cold, this is a time to come into the sanctuary, to ask the Lord again to forgive you of your sin, to wash you clean. If that's you today, that you need a restored relationship with the Lord, you need forgiveness for your sins, you want a relationship with Jesus, will you raise your hand? But some of you might have emotions that you have stuffed down and you have been afraid to bring before the Lord, whether it's disappointment with life, frustration, grief, um, anger. Maybe it's even joy in things that are not of God. If there are things that you need to bring before the Lord today, and we'll still, it's like still secret, but if you would like me to pray for you, raise your hand if there's something that you want to bring before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we don't have to be embarrassed to bring our humanity before you. Lord, you created us emotional beings. Lord, will you help us to have uh, right feelings about things, Lord? Lord, right now I pray for each person in this room who is maybe grieving or struggling with disappointment or frustration with life, Lord. I pray that you will minister to them in a special way. Lord, I pray that you will speak to them, that they know clearly that you're aware of the situation, Lord. Will you comfort them, Lord, and remind them that you are already with them and holding them by their right hand. Lord, we all bring ourselves before you in openness, and ask you to change our perspective where maybe we don't have right understanding. Lord, will you help us to um, feel for your glory? Will you help us to have emotions, Lord, that reflect your emotions? Lord, will you help us to take delight and joy in the things that delight you? Will you help us, God, to align our values and our beliefs, Lord, with the things that you value, with the things that you call good. And Lord, we stand in the gap, Lord, for our world, where we look around and we see injustice, and we see hatred, and we see evil, and it seems like it's flourishing. But God, we thank you that we know the final story, that in the end, you win, and because you have us by the right hand, we win. Lord, I pray for each person here that you'll keep them this week that your hand will be upon them, Lord, that you will bless them, God, that you will give them opportunities to speak into their communities, Lord, that you will protect them and bless them. In your name we pray, amen. Um, in conclusion, if you will stand, I'd like to speak a final blessing over you as our benediction. This is a blessing from Max Licato. May the hero of all history talk personally to you. May you find in Jesus the answer to the deepest needs of your life. May you remember your highest privilege. You are known by God and cherished by heaven. Amen.